Good morning, friends. It is great to be together on this beautiful summer morning. And we are glad that you are coming, whether you come with coffee mug in hand and bathrobe on, whether you're out on the back deck, whether you come on Sunday or Thursday. We welcome you to the worship of First Congregational Church and to the life of discipleship that we share. This morning, I would like to use a lovely call to worship that comes from one of the texts that are offered on the Text Week site. And I haven't gone to this place before, and I'd like to share it with you. So our call goes like this together. Holy friend, we come to worship you, and we ask for the sensibility to know your greatness. We ask for the wisdom to understand how complete you are. We ask for you to humble us that we might accept your hiddenness. And we ask for the faith to trust just how close your presence is to us. And we ask for the great good fortune to love and adore your beauty. This is the work of worship. Good morning. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 25, verses 9 through 34, the story of Jacob and Esau. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean, from Paddan Aram, and sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples with, from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out, with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was sixty years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among, among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Please join Lucy in singing the first two verses of Standing on the Promises.
I were to ask any of you whether you see any divisiveness in the world, I bet if we put our answers together, we would have quite a long list. There are divides in our families, and over the years I've known a few who could honestly say there's a family member they have not spoken to in the last 10 years. We have divisions in the area of religious faith. We have the great schism between Protestant and Catholic, and then all the little divisions in the Protestant tradition into all the various denominations. We are divided economically between the very wealthy now and the very poor. We are divided politically in camps that seem to grow more cast in concrete as the years go by. And even within those two political parties of Democrat and Republican, there are fractures of conservatives and liberals. And even if we look at the, the socioeconomic fabric of our whole culture, right now, the division between blacks and whites, maybe for the first time in a long time, has come to the fore in such a way that we be can begin to look at that with honesty and truth. Sometimes that sense of being divided from each other is more than I can bear. And so when I looked at the scripture readings this week, I wanted to look at the Genesis reading, which talks about all the divisions in one of the patriarchal families of ancient Israel to see if I could find out how or if those divisions can be healed and what part we as human beings might play and what part God needs to play. We focus in on Isaac and Rebecca, who are the middle of the trilogy of the patriarchal families, Abraham and Sarah coming before, and of course, Jacob and Leah and Rachel coming after. All the patriarchal families share certain things in common, but in the family of Isaac and Rebecca, there is so much that seems to stand as an obstacle for the promise that God gave Abraham that he would be the father of many generations and the promise that he would come to a land that was built just for this people and they would be fruitful and multiply and get, garner God's blessing to the end of the age. Some of, those blessing, some of those obstacles to the blessing are similar in that Isaac took a long time to come to marriage. And when he came to marriage with Rebecca, they realized very soon that she was also barren, just as Sarah had been. So again, the blessing is pushing against the barrenness and the old age of the two persons who are involved. And not only that, but when the children are born into this union between Isaac and Rebecca, there is a divisiveness and a struggle that goes on from the time they were together as twins in the womb of Rebecca. And Rebecca feels so miserable in her pregnancy that she goes to God and asks in prayer, if I must maintain this pregnancy in such misery, what is it going to be good for? And the oracle that comes from God is that this that she is about to birth is an age-old enmity between these two twins, is an enmity that will issue in something new according to God, and that is 
that the younger will supplant the older. And the one that seems to have the physical strength will be overtaken by the one who is the quiet spirit, the spiritual spirit, might we say, and will upset the whole notion of inheritance that it has existed in the Jewish tradition up until this moment. Then once the twins come into the family, it happens that Rebecca, one parent, loves Jacob more than Jacob's father. And Isaac, as father, loves Esau more than the other twin, Jacob. And so not even the parents can be on the same page. It feels as if there is a thicket that is in front of this family. And the thicket is so dense and so interwoven in all of the spheres of their lives. You wonder how on earth this promise is going to work through these divides and these empty places or these thicketed spots in order for it to be able to be, to come to its fruition. And I think that as I thought a lot about this scripture and I read it again and again, there are stepping stones that the human beings in this story um, provide for God's spirit to work through the obstacles and the thickets in order for the promise to come to be. One of those stepping stones, or actually two of the stepping stones, come one from Isaac and one from Rebecca. When Isaac learns of his wife barrenness, he goes immediately to God in prayer and seeks for her release and her ability to become a fertile wife. It takes 20 years because he prays when he marries at 40 and the twins don't come until 60. But his prayer is followed by Rebecca's prayer where she seeks God's help and God's strength for what she is about to bring and to birth into this world. So human prayer becomes a means by which the promise inches forward. But Rebecca does a little bit more than that in an unusual example of a matriarchal's strength of faith. She responds to the oracle that God has given her that this younger child is going to be the inheritor of the promise. And she takes action toward that end. It is not exactly a part of our scripture reading this morning, but if you were to read farther in what, beyond what Jennifer gave to us, you'll see that when she discovers that Isaac is about ready to give the blessing on his son and to give the only blessing that he has. She devises a scheme in order to fool Isaac in the dimness of his eyesight of his older years and she pushes Jacob forward so that the blessing might be able to happen as God has provided it to her mind and her heart. So maybe some of what is needed is not only prayer, but also the response of trust and maybe the action of trust that comes when you know and feel in your heart that this blessing must be given a chance. And maybe in the end, it's the one who receives the blessing himself that helps it to come to be. Because upon receipt of the blessing from Isaac, Jacob flees and he never hears the bitter cry of his brother when his brother discovers that his father has no blessing to give him and that he as the firstborn son, is out of everything. No blessing, no land, no great flocks, 
they will go instead to Jacob because he has denied his birthright. And Jacob has scarfed it out from under him for a bowl of lentil beef stew. But Jacob himself, once he has the birthright and the blessing, struggles with God all night long. And when he finally prevails, he names the place where he has been. I have seen God. I have struggled with God. I have prevailed. And so as I think about this middle story of the patriarchs, and I realize just how much jeopardy the promise was in by all sorts of factors. Still, in this story of uneven characters who live with patches of righteousness and patches of deceit, who live unevenly in love with the fleshly temptations that satisfy their appetites, and yet that searching with their spirits for something beyond. In these unlikely people, there still is that good work on the human's part of prayer and trust and action that brings the, the promise to the fore. But ultimately, what this story tells us is that God will never relent. God as the covenant keeper, God as the oath maker and oath holder, God as the promise bringer and the one who wishes more than anything that God's people are full and rich with the promise of God's loving presence and the beauty of his abiding grace. Never, ever lets go. Works with what he's been given, the flawed nature of humanity, and all the little cracks and openings that God sees that no one else sees. And he pushes that promise forward and forward and forward. And so, my friends, from this ancient, ancient story, I bring you the hope that I see for the present day and all the divisions in which we live and move and have our being. Do not give up. God has not let go of this promise that God intends to fulfill, not only through the patriarchs, but all the, pro all the prophets as well, and now through the gift of his only son, who abides with us, who walks with us, we too, flawed human beings. And if, he, if we can give this new Christ who bears the promise toward its fulfillment, if we can pray with him and for him and by his good grace, if we can trust and respond to his guidance, there is no way that the promise of unity and fruitfulness and grace and one people, and one baptism, and one God, is not possible. It was not possible in Isaac and Rebecca's day, nor in Jacob and Leah and Rachel's day, nor even in Christ's day. But the promise waits, not to end, but to be fulfilled. It may not come in our day, but it will come, held in God's hands until it flowers in all its glory and beauty and wisdom and truth for all of us who perhaps by that time will be one. Oh, may God make that come now in strength and in fullness. Amen. Friends, I pray with you not only for the unity that we so dearly wish for 
in our families and neighborhoods and land. But also pray for all those who are trying to make us whole as people in the flesh. And for all those who work tirelessly, tirelessly in telehealth conferencing to make us whole of body, mind, and spirit. And so might we gather together in these words of prayer in this time of need of prayer. O oh, glorious God, we are always seeking your presence, but today we come seeking your intervention during these trying times as a global family. Sibling rivalry and tribal rivalry have taken over our hearts, and we ask you with all urgency and humility to restore the unity that is possible among us. Grant us humility and patience in endurance. Urge us to treat each other with respect, regardless of what divides us. Exchange our prideful hearts for hearts that are cheered first by you and the bearing of your promise toward us. And let us be willing to be corrected at every turn, willing to change our ways, willing to see with new eyes and to believe with new hearts. That as long as we are open, as long as we keep our eyes and our hearts and our wills focused on you, that your wish remains that we live long and fruitful lives in the kingdom of love which you have ordained for all your children. And in the hope of that kingdom, we pray together the prayer you have given us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are pleased that you have chosen to be part of our worship service here at First Congregational Church of Hampton, the church that has been proclaiming Jesus Christ in Hampton since 1638. We are a Christ-centered church with an inviting faith, a growing faith, and a serving faith, and we welcome you to join us in accomplishing this mission. We also encourage you to join in the wonderful worship of giving. You can give securely online or by check using the giving information on your screen. We are a praying church and we sincerely want to pray with you for any needs you may have. You may send those prayer requests to the church office by email, which is also on your screen. Again, we are happy that you have joined us in this service and hope that you will be part of our worship again soon. Friends, it has been an a very graceful time together to be with you today. And I thought since Jennifer and Mary offered us a prelude that sort of had the lilt of the Celtic hills in it, I would share with you a benediction that also comes from the Celtic island of Iona and from the worshiping community, community at the abbey there. Go and hear these words as we go out into the world together. May the God who shakes heaven and earth, whom death could not contain, who lives to disturb us and heal us, may this God bless each one of us with the power to go forth as ones who bear the promise and proclaim the gospel of peace.